So I have some questions about climate change. I am very aware that I need to be very careful in the way that I express this idea. But I'm interested in, in climate change on a number of levels. I mean, I used to be an earth science teacher. I'm interested in the science. I'm interested in, you know, just understanding earth systems. Um, but what really intrigues me about climate change is the rhetoric. And there's kind of a three-step argument. Layer one, the climate is changing. Layer two, humans are the cause. Layer three, the results of that climate change caused by humans is going to be disastrous and kill us. And then step four, conclusion, is therefore we as a people need to do something about it. That last layer I find to be the most interesting, particularly because it requires collective action. This is a, a version of an argument that's called the tragedy of the commons. And it's probably the single best argument um, the single best kind of argument for centralized control. Basically you say that individual actors left to their own autonomy are going to, in the aggregate, lead to a disaster, which is bad for all the individuals, even though they're pursuing their self-interest. So if, by pursuing your self-interest, you end up, you know, causing problems for yourself. Therefore, we need something that prevents us from acting out our self-interest. In other words, we need something to control us. So that argument I find fascinating. It's probably the best argument that there is for centralized control. Okay, so my questions related to climate change factor in at level three. So there's layer one, the climate is changing. That's just a matter of having climate stations taking you know, measurements of temperature and looking at stuff. Data with climate is really awkward because everything past about 100 years ago were using proxies for temperature, which you know could add problems. But they're good. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to trust them. I'm going to trust that right now. So the climate is changing. Okay, I buy that. Second thing, humans are causing that change. Well, that actually makes a lot of sense. The way that carbon dioxide works is that it's colored. If you hold up a remote control up to the lens of your camera and try to push the buttons, your camera will see light that you can't see. It's in the infrared spectrum. And what happens is, if you put a sheet of glass in between that signal and your camera, you won't see the signal anymore. That's because glass, which is transparent to our eyes, actually blocks certain colors. It, it is tinted. And the air, the various gases of our atmosphere, are tinted as well, just not to visible light. And so, I mean, where does that energy go? It's just like painting the sidewalk black. We all know that makes it heat up because it absorbs that energy. Okay, so I buy that. Um, the climate is being heated up by humans. Okay, now we get to argument level three, which is, as a result of this climate change, we are in for earth-shattering disasters. And this is the one I don't buy. So the doom and gloom prophecies about what are going to happen as a result of climate change, they fall into a number of different categories. One of them is that we're going to see more extreme weather. So more extreme weather, more tornadoes, hurricanes, natural disasters, those are bad. Having more of them would be a bad thing. And the argument for that one basically goes, if you increase the energy budget of the atmosphere, more heat in the atmosphere, what you're, I mean, more heat energy, that's the energy that fuels the weather, heat and heat, hot air rises, that causes uh, all the weather and wind that we experience on planet Earth. And so more heat would mean more weather. The trouble with this is while the argument works on its face, that's not actually how the weather works. The weather, or any system that uses energy to do work, such as wind, is not actually based off of the absolute temperature, it's based off of the relative temperature. It's about how big of a difference you can have between a high concentration of energy and a low concentration of energy so that you can get flow from one to the other. And that um, actually might decrease with climate change. So the, the example of this is if you stick which has more potential energy? Which has more, you know, kinetic energy waiting to happen? A lake at 10,000 feet or a lake at 1,000 feet? And assume they're the same size lake. The higher one is going to have more energy available. It's going to be, it's going to have more energy. And if you stick a water wheel into that lake and say, well, it has so much energy, the water wheel should turn really fast. But it's not moving. It's the difference in height. Um, 
you have to have flow from an area that's high to an area that's low in order to get useful work out of it. So increasing the amount of net energy in our atmosphere does not actually create more weather. What you'd have to prove and show is that you'd have a net increase in the amount of variability um, between the highs and lows in our atmosphere. And funny enough, the, the major driver of weather, to my understanding, which is pretty meager, um, is that the poles actually drive a lot of our weather. It's like sea currents. Um, the, the major driver of sea currents is the difference between the temperature of our planet at the equator and the poles. And so the climate change models that we've been looking at, again, to my meager understanding, show that the greatest differences in temperature we're going to see are in raising the temperature of the poles, which means net decrease in variability in terms of how much energy there is. And that would mean that we're actually going to see less weather globally. And that kind of gets borne out. I mean, we have had less hurricanes in the last 10 years. I mean, more reporting on them for sure, but less of them. And so that's interesting. And I mean, that raises some skepticism for doom and gloom claims. Let's look at the other categories. Another doom and gloom category is ocean acidification. And frankly, if this one was true, I mean, that is the end of life as we know it. That is horrible. Like soda, the oceans absorb a fair amount of carbon dioxide, which makes them acidic. Carbon dioxide, when dissolved, makes for an acid. And so if you increase the level of acidity in the water, maybe that makes it too hard for uh, marine organisms to pull calcium out of the water in order to make their shells. Under these conditions, things like uh, coral would go away. Things like, um, but, but that, things like coral would go away, but that's not the major problem. The major problem would be that the super, super small microorganisms and, and not quite microorganisms that live in the water that feed basically everything in the global food web, if they died off and weren't able to create their shells and weren't able to live in the water because it was too acidic, then everything above them dies and it's like mass hysteria. And the effects from that on life on land would be that basically everything dies. I mean, that would be the end of life as we know it. The trouble with that one is that, okay, a couple of things. One, um, just like if you would leave a soda out on a hot day, the solubility of gases in a liquid decreases with an increase in temperature, which means if you make it hotter, it actually holds less gas. Maybe you counterbalance that by having more of it in the atmosphere to begin with. So, I mean, that's something you have to take into account. And then the most acidic part of our oceans is, in, is a patch right off the coast of Peru, which happens to be some of the best fishing ground on the planet. And add to that that our oceans are already slightly basic, slightly alkaline. So I'm not really buying that one. And when you see footage of dead, um, you know, bleached coral demonstrating ocean acidification, that's not actually caused by ocean acidification. That's caused directly by an increase in temperature. It's caused by warm water going a little deeper than it should, which is usually related to El Nino weather. Again, according to my meager understanding. And so that one doesn't hold up. And I'm starting to notice a trend. Um, so we've got weather, we've got ocean acidification. The next one is sea level rise. I mean, that one's complicated. For this one, we're not taking into account any floating ice. Any ice that's already floating is not going to make the water rise when it melts. You can try this experiment at home by melting ice cubes in a glass. The level stays the same. However, there's massive amounts of water on Antarctica and on Greenland and on Siberia, which, you know, if that all went into the ocean, maybe the ocean level rises. That makes sense. And also, if you increase the temperature of the ocean, it actually expands, which again raises the, the amount. I, I buy all that. That makes perfect sense. Um, the part where I have a problem, though, is that, one, with an increase in temperature of the planet, not only would the ocean expand, but more of it would end up in the atmosphere, which, you know, causes runaway greenhouse gas effect, because water is actually a pretty powerful greenhouse gas on its own. But then cloud cover factors into that as well, and so I, I start to wonder, and then, you know, most human settlements are really close to water, so a rise in sea level affects a lot of humanity. It doesn't affect me much. I mean, I live in the tops of the mountains in the middle of a very desert part of the planet. So climate change, playing, you know, shuffling the deck as far as climate goes, can really only benefit where I live. But not being selfish, um, I can see that one. But then the question is, how much does it change? 
Does it change enough that it's a disaster? And what is the best way to counteract that? That's a separate question. That's, that's a problem that I buy. Sea level rise. Now, how much? Um, I think that's the kind of thing that we should talk to the Dutch to fix, frankly, um, with weirs and dams and all the things that they have used successfully to stop the North Sea and to, to make the Isomere and to do the amazing flood works that are part of the, the plane out in, uh, out in Zeeland. So I don't see that one as a, a global change the climate in order to fix the problem issue. So basically those three. Um, I don't buy the one about increased weather because that's not how weather works according to my understanding. I don't buy the one about ocean acidification because that's not how coral bleaching works and that's also not how our oceans seem to work. And it's not how gases dissolved in water work. And then the one about sea level rise, I get that one. Oh, and then the next one, drought. An increase in global drought. Uh, no. The Sahara is only a desert and, you know, the western United States is only a desert because we're technically still in an ice age. If you increase the temperature of the planet, you I, I assume, my understanding is, that you would actually equalize or homogenize the amount of water access on the planet. You would have more, uh, fewer deserts on the planet. More water in the air, more humid skies, less evaporation from the land. Which means more of the water you get, you keep. So that's another one that I don't quite buy. Anyway, um, one of the things that I want to point out from this video is, one, I'm not an expert on this. I've just been thinking about it a lot. And take these thoughts for what they're worth. I would love to hear a response from somebody who really knows what they're talking about. Like uh, Curtis Bowdy. I I'd like to hear something from him. Or maybe Veritasium. Um, you know, shooting big. But it complicates the issue when you're talking about climate change or debating climate change. Because it's not one thing. You can argue about whether it's happening. That's layer one. You can argue about what's causing it. That's layer two. You can argue about what the effects of it will be. That's layer three. And then you can argue about what it is that we should be doing about it. That's layer four. And of course, layer four depends very heavily on the previous three layers. And I've brought out some issues in layer three that, according to my understanding, appear to be issues. I hope that I've handled that well. I mean, it's a sensitive issue. I'm probably gonna be labeled as a science denier by some. I don't mean for this to be overly political, I just find it fascinating because it is a political argument. Um, because effectively we're con talking about what to do, and the issues about what to do are political. And therefore the discussion becomes political. Funny. I'd like to do a separate video about layer 5, which is kind of like this meta layer where you talk about how the arguments are used by various people, and that'll come up eventually. but. I thought I'd get this out first. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like and subscribe button below. If you hated the video, please leave comments explaining, and please be respectful as you do so, and we look forward to seeing you next time.